we have a countdown here. Please don't be afraid, it's just a countdown. I just want to show you how much 80 seconds is. Every 80 seconds, we need a blood product in Austria's hospitals. So after this countdown, there's one red blood cell unit going to a hospital. After another countdown, there's another product going into one of the hospitals. Um, this is very challenging because Austria is a country um, where the Red Cross has committed itself to provide around the clock uh, supply of blood products. That's not usual across the world. There are very, very few uh, countries that manage it. We have uh, enough products to supply our patients. And essentially my job is to find people every day, every week, every month that are willing to donate at the right time to provide the products every 80 seconds. The countdown is nearing zero, so we are needing our product in five seconds. My name is Lars Eberhardt. I'm the head of donor management with the blood services of the Austrian Red Cross, and my job with my team is to get the people to donate. And um, we've solved a challenge. We have enough donors in rural areas. The smaller the, the town, the better. Why? In a small town, you have healthy social structures. You talk to the priest, the mayor, and the pub owner. They talk with everybody. People talk with their neighbor, neighbors. And you achieve donation rates in very small towns far from Vienna at about 9 to 10 percent of the population is an active donor. In Vienna, the donation rate is a little bit over 1 percent. To put into context how much that is, in this room, if my calculations are not completely wrong, 1 percent would be the not-so-crowded first row. And the rest are non-donors. So, we took upon ourselves the most difficult scenario, that is to find donors in Vienna. And the goal was 1,000 new donors for the Viennese Blood Center in 2015. Um, how can this be done? I told you already, in small towns, there are, there are social networks that work offline. And of course, in Vienna, we were trying to find offline social networks, but you don't know your neighbor who lives behind you, uh, over you, the, on the other uh, uh, floor. And then we uh, partnered with Campaigning Bureau and asked ourselves, how can this be done? And of course, number one, find new donors. Create some kind of easy setup. You don't want high uh, entries, uh, barriers to entry, you want a low, barrier, make an appointment, there's this sense of commitment, because we noticed that when you make an appointment online, it's the same as in the restaurant. Just by committing to something, you increase the rates. And then, of course, the main goal is not appointments, it's to donate blood. And there we found two angles. Number one, there are existing blood donors. Some here, probably or not, are a donor. And every donor has a story. Why do I donate? When did I decide to become a donor? What, what motivations are behind my behavior? And of course, there are new donors who want to hear the story. They want to hear from somebody, why should I donate? That's something that in the offline communities, in small towns, works very well. People sit in the guest house at the pub and tell, OK, I donate because people hear that. And one of the main motivators to donate blood is because some person I care about donates blood. Donor recruits donor. And then is this letter of engagement. In the past, we worked with the upper three steps. You became a donor in our database by donating. So imagine that we set up 
a blood drive here today. And in the lobby, you suddenly found a mobile blood drive. And we had a coffee break. You go out and see this blood drive. And then we are asking from you to, in seconds or minutes, inform yourself, what is this? How long does it take? What will happen? Will I survive it? Then you have to decide. Then you have to do it. And we found out it's too much. We are asking too much from non-donors. Suddenly, it's like assaulting people at a blood drive. You have to decide, you have to inform yourself, you have to do it. And people then said, oh no, I have an appointment, and ran away. So we added the additional steps. And we said, OK, tell non-donors simple facts. Awake their interest. If you go out on the street, make a survey, and ask people, do you think blood donations are important? Over 90% of the people will say, oh, yeah, yeah, very important. Should be done, should be done. When we reach the last step, becoming a donor, in Austria, you have 3%. So the loss across the chain is huge. And let's not forget, Philip Dalton's, everybody thinks he's different. We are different, of course. The difference in our um, process is fear. We shouldn't argue with fear, but there is fear here. It's the fear of the puncture, some kind of primal fear we all have. And 70% of new donors told us that they had fear. So by assaulting donors or non-donors and asking them to inform themselves, decide, do it in a sense of fear was too much. So we choose this letter of engagement, small steps, give them small bits, again with Philip, the small bits of information. So the right question is, are you eligible? We have a homepage, of course. And our homepage was shaped for um, um, donors. So somebody who already donated 10 times could inform himself on many, many questions on blood donation. Can I donate after spending my holidays in Egypt? Can I donate after taking this or that medication? So we have 200 medications on the, on the homepage. We have 100 countries on the homepage. For a non-donor, it is overwhelming. And the donor, the non-donor reads our homepage, and after reading, he thinks nobody can donate. There are so many reasons for non-donating that I shouldn't even try it. So we broke down all these criteria into very, very simple ones. Are you over 18 years old? Are you over 50 kilograms? Do you feel healthy? And then you are eligible for blood donation. And the second question we, of course, asked, are you in? By asking, are you in? We are not asking too much. We are not asking to inform, decide, and do. We are just asking, would you be willing to help? And many people say, OK, yes, I will, will uh, put my email there and click on yes. I am willing to help. So in the past, we only got active donors into the database, and now we are getting interested people into the database, who at some point said, yes, I am willing to help. I'm interested in helping. Can I help? And then we have very simple questions afterwards. We reduced the homepage. We put, put some funny facts there, like how, how many Coca-Colas were, were being drunk in our blood center. It's real-time data, so we programmed a Coca-Cola counter that <laughs> really shows you how many sausages are being eaten in the blood center, how many Coke is being drunk. It was a very, very complicated programming process, but we managed to do it. So it's, it's informative in a funny way. Not we, we went away from this medical process talking about hygiene, talking about HB levels, uh, blood levels. We, we put some funny things there. And afterwards, we put some information. 
and tried not to overwhelm people with facts. We took out the medication lists, we took out the country lists, we put out the huge list of possible treatments and operations and replaced it with the basic information a non-donor would need to help him decide to donate, which is, number one, how long does this take? That's one of the questions you really didn't find on the original homepage. It was somewhere, but because of the overwhelming, people were looking for it and not finding it. Where can I donate and how will this happen? happen? This, that's it. And at Why Not, the only um, non-donor uh, motive we put in there is tattoos, because we found out that many people misunderstood the tattoos. They thought, oh, I'm, I got a tattoo, I will never be able to donate again. So we explained, of course you can donate again after waiting a small amount of time. Um, and that's, that's the beautiful part. Um, we are talking about storytelling and we could tell the stories by ourselves, but we took the easy way, we took the detour, we didn't do it by ourselves. We asked people to tell the story. So donors went into the homepage and wrote down their stories. And the guy on the left, we were talking about them yesterday. This is a bunch of extreme sport type people. They do snowboarding, uh, parachute diving, and so on. And he says that uh, additionally to his passion for sport, he wants to be, uh, there's also responsibility. And by uh, taking this responsibility seriously, he's a donor. And other people, people that non-donors can relate to, non-donors, oh, he, he or she is like me, they are also active blood donors. And something we also found out is that many people were willing to share their story as a recipient. And one of the main questions we hear from young people who are not sure if they should donate or not should donate, is what will happen with my blood? Who am I helping? And here we are closing the gap. The donor story, the recipient story. Let me show you an example. It's a person that uh, an urban population can relate to, and she tells her story. She's a nurse. And by being a nurse, she not only is a donor, she knows why this is important, because through her work, she sees how urgently blood and blood products are needed. Um, a recipient, many years ago, I had a serious skiing accident, something every Austrian can relate to, and this serious skier needed countless blood transfusions. So you have a face, you have a story that you see, and at that time, because he got so many blood products, he decided to donate regularly. And community engagement happens. Uh, Philip showed us many, many examples, and the tools you are using here is the same. You on Facebook, you on Twitter, use your online social communities, your online social networks to spread the world. I joined, I, I committed, I said, yes, I am willing, and share this message on Facebook. And my friends, my network reads, okay, this guy decided to help in this kind of way. Probably I can join him. And the initial success is, of course, we had response in the media. The different uh, um, media outlets were talking about this because this is something new. We managed to spread the world. word. We used, of course, the... the um, email database, we used different databases to send out the, the link to this page. And evaluation after three months, we are just starting. So this is very, very new. And the initial su success is 2,500 registrations. People that are willing to help, they clicked on, I will do this. 1,369 stories were posted, and that's huge. That's, of course, huge. And then the, we have 152 new donors, which we could directly relate to the two. 
and through observation of the people coming to, the, to our establishment, we know that there are more of them. I think that many people, just by seeing the stories, by, by following uh, the timelines, decided to go to donate blood. We see a rise in new donors in the blood center. So there is an additional amount of donors that just decided to go, not register it, just do it because they saw all the information, the stories, they feel, felt engaged and um, decided to donate. And of course, I wouldn't be very good at my job if I don't ask you to register. My colleague Karina is waiting outside and you can, <laughs> you can, we did lock the doors of course, you can go outside and register if you feel engaged by me. Thank you very much.